Hello everybody, welcome uh, again to our uh, webinar. Uh, this is uh, becoming today uh, a very uh, often and regular webinars that we are giving from Ingram Micro Cybersecurity Business Unit. My name is Mark Assis, I am the Cybersecurity Business Unit Director and I'm very pleased today to introduce to you uh, our uh, webinar. So if we uh, move to the agenda, just give me a second. So today we, I'm going to uh, make this introduction and then we will move uh, straight forward to the main topic of uh, this uh, webinar, uh, which is uh, the, uh, uh, the success metrics of incident uh, response and how to manage the uh, incidents. And later, uh, Vikram is going to provide you with uh, the update about our uh, initiatives and activity uh, that we are uh, doing as we speak and we are building up for the next uh, 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 the remaining of the year uh, in cybersecurity business units and hopefully in the meantime you would have asked your questions on the chat uh, window uh, we would try to answer to these questions at the end of the of the webinar so now uh, uh, introducing the topic of today i would like to 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 say a few words uh, uh, it's it's about uh, the incident response uh, today it's uh, this topic is becoming very hot as you can know, you can see uh, we know that uh, incidents are happening are happening all the time every every day sometimes and every week surely we know that incidents are going to happen we it's like earthquakes we never know when and uh, we never know what is the uh, how bad they will be so uh, the, the webinar uh, today uh, that Praveen is going to give you is all about how to, uh, uh, how to follow up uh, an incident response, uh, what are the major uh, principles and topics that need to be addressed. So uh, before I leave the floor to Praveen, I would like also to uh, tell you that I am very happy to announce that, uh, and uh, of course uh, Vikram is going to speak about it uh, extensively, you will have a, a live demo at the end. Uh, we are very pleased to announce that our website is now ready with a lot of information, with a lot of, uh, uh, of content that you can use and you can follow us up on it. So this is uh, for the end of the uh, webinar with Vikram. And now uh, let me introduce to you uh, Praveen uh, Joseph, who is uh, our consultant and trainer, and he's going to speak about the success metrics in incident response. Enjoy the webinar and uh, keep in touch with you later on. Thank you very much. Praveen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be given an opportunity to speak with everybody here today. My name is Praveen. I'm a cybersecurity consultant and trainer. And uh, what I will be doing over the next few minutes throughout the course of this webinar is try to identify what are the success metrics that go into uh, cybersecurity incident response. Now, as Mark rightly stated, incidents are the norm today. If you look at business, it is not a question of when you're going to be breached. It's not a question of if you're going to be breached. It's a question of rather when and how bad is it going to be when we get breached. Cybercrime is a growing industry in itself and it is really, really alive and thriving. And organizations really have to gear up and protect themselves to um, and, and, and equip themselves to protect their enterprises against a cybercrime or a cyber attack. How successful are these efforts? That is the question that really needs to be answered in today's context because organizations are setting up incident response teams. They are setting up procedures. They are investing in tools. But what is the success ratio of these efforts? How do we measure that? That is the objective of this webinar. And, and I, I shouldn't be taking more than 30 to 40 minutes of, my, of your time, uh, at the end of which we should have a few tangible metrics with which we can measure the success of a cybersecurity incident response program. First off, let's uh, establish some basic foundational knowledge. What really is a cybersecurity incident? Now, this is a term that is very, very loosely used throughout cybersecurity parlance, and, and everybody talks about incidents, but how really do you define this? So what I thought is a very, very fundamental definition of a cybersecurity incident. If you can look up on your screen, you can see that we have the three foundational pillars of any information security system, which is 
the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your data. These form the crux of any cybersecurity program. What we can con we can define as a, as a cybersecurity incident is when these three paradigms are compromised. That is when there is disclosure, modification, destruction, or you know unavailability of information. That is what can be considered to be a cybersecurity incident. Now, to be a, uh, to provide a very very specific definition, not all of these instances can be constructed can can be construed to be an incident. There is something called an event, and then we have something called an incident. So, for instance, a negative occurrence, like for example, someone has written his, his or her password down. It doesn't really have to be a cybersecurity incident. We can call it an event or a negative occurrence, which can lead to a cybersecurity incident. So, I've written my password down. When someone <clears throat> when someone else misuses that information to cause breach of data, to to cause disclosure, modification, or destruction of data. That is what would be constructed, would be construed to be a cybersecurity incident. So we have to get these terms really clear right at the outset. That's the reason I put the slide up in the front. We have incidents and we also have events. So multiple events are what work together in sequence to form a cybersecurity incident. With that definition in mind, let us go towards what is a cybersecurity incident response program. Right now, every organization has its own set of terms, its own set of definitions depending on the nature of the organization. But if you look at it, they all will contain few common steps across all of them. So these are the steps that constitute your incident response program. And basically their objective is to first off detect that an incident has occurred and contain it as quickly as possible and with minimum impact as possible. Second point is try to identify what is the root cause of this incident. Where did this incident originate from and what is the reason that it actually happened? Next up, you'll have to try and resume business operations as quickly as possible, which is what happens in the recovery phase. And lastly, you have lessons learned, basically, which is from the root cause. You'll try to identify what are steps that we can do to prevent this particular incident from happening again. Now, the terms that you see on this slide are, I'm sure everybody in the audience has seen before. OK, there is nothing really new on this particular slide, but you have to realize that these are steps which are common across organizations incident response programs. The primary objective is first of detecting that the incident has actually occurred. How quickly do we detect it? That is a very, very key success criterion of your incident response program. How quickly can we contain the incident and minimize the damage? And then how capable, how equipped is our team to identify, to do an analysis and find out what is the root cause of this incident? And how quickly can we work with each other, work with our with our third parties, our vendors, our suppliers, and work internally, especially within large organizations, uh, carry out coordination efforts to recover quickly from the incident. And lastly, how effective are our lessons learned program, right? So how do we define these lessons learned and how do we percolate them throughout the organization so the same incident does not happen over and over again? Various organizations have different degrees of success in each of these steps. What we'll do is we'll look at each of these steps through a formal mechanism and try to identify what are the key success metrics in each of them. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But first off, we need to understand that cybersecurity incident management is not something that can happen in silos. All right, it has to be holistically spread across multiple domains of an organization. And the three key domains are what you see up on this particular slide, namely people, processes, and technologies. Many organizations, that, as a, and we'll talk about this on the next few slides as well, many organizations still consider cybersecurity to be, security to be a technical issue. Cybersecurity incident response is a technical process, and that is a, a, a very huge fallacy un, under which many organizations still continue to operate. As you and I might, might certainly agree, cybersecurity has to be ingrained within the DNA of an organization. It has to be spread across the people, processes, and technologies. So when I say people, you can see three bullet points here, namely management, sponsorship, end user awareness, and subject matter experts. What do each of these mean? We should have the senior management to understand that the role of cybersecurity is not something that is, uh, that is to be considered in silos. It has to be spread across the enterprise, and they should be willing to invest in cybersecurity uh, incident response tools as well as uh, defining processes for better maturity in cybersecurity. End users. People who are not aware of cybersecurity basic principles, like for example, password sharing, which we discussed earlier, phishing, clicking on phishing links, uh, these are also an important dimension of a successful cybersecurity incident management program. 
and lastly the availability of experts within the organization or external consultants but these people should be available qualified resources should be available to help an organization to understand what is the reason that an incident has occurred so training is one of the key ways to actually equip your people enable them to protect the organization defend its its entire enterprise completely from cyber security incidents on the technology front we have multiple products which help both from a pre, from a proactive approach as well as from a reactive approach these tools help in detecting threats and monitoring uh, the network for for existing attacks or upcoming attacks as well as in providing threat intelligence we have multiple solutions provided by vendors we will be looking at few of these technology products as well over the next few slides and lastly processes an organization needs to have a well defined incident management policy still organizations continue to operate on without such a policy in place they have an information security policy they have risk management policies but a proper and comprehensive incident management policy is still not available in many organizations and this is coming from our experience also defining success metrics for existing incident management policies incident management procedures this is something that organizations are still not even thinking about and this webinar actually is focusing on this topic mainly which is identifying the success metrics of your existing incident management policy so consultancy working with you know with qualified incident response professionals or consultants is one of the ways organizations can fill this void a few stats on how cyber security incidents are hitting the middle east when you look at this data now this is taken from the pwc report dated uh, march 2016 you can look that the frequency of the imp of the incidents experienced in the middle east has been increasing tremendously when you compare it with the rest of the world now the green slides here talk about the middle east whereas the blue bars talk about the rest of the world so the middle east in the middle east at least 13% of organizations experience between 5000 and 100000 incidents in the year 2015 and it's only been growing since then the impact of these incidents in terms of revenue loss as well as in terms of lost productivity and downtime is also significantly higher in the middle east when you compare it to the rest of the world so what this means is the the middle east is increasingly under attack when you compare it with the rest of the world and there are reasons for this which we will discuss on the next slide right this particular slide which is sourced from the geneva center for security talks about the main reasons why attackers target the middle east and and the points that you see here are are pretty uh, obvious for the, for the lack of a better word the first term is the first reason is lack of sufficient cyber security awareness senior management in many organizations still do not appreciate the fact that cyber security is real and it is happening here and now they still fail to appreciate this and and operate under a, a false sense of security so this makes it easier for for cyber criminals to target their organizations legislation this is a, a global challenge because as as you will appreciate cyber crime is not something that is restricted to one geographical region rather it is spread across the world now the us and eu are bringing in um, stricter regulations we have gdpr coming up in the eu next year these rules these laws rather actually make it more difficult for organizations not to comply with cyber security requirements however in the middle east we still are lacking lagging behind in, in, in the legislation space also not only from a legal framework also from an internal regulatory framework within organizations the presence of regulatory rules policies and and procedures within organizations is also not up to the mark in many organizations in the middle east and this brings us to the next point which is implementation of security controls although organizations are pursuing compliance with standards like pci dss iso 27001 hipaa etc in the middle east and this is something that is marketed very well as well for the organizations and and there are be, uh, genuine efforts being taken in these directions the actual implementation of security is not really up to the mark we will be looking at this in one of the next few slides and lastly we come up to the presence of abundant cash resources the probability of hitting a bigger reward if you are if you carry out a successful cyber attack on on an organization in the middle east it is significantly higher when you compare it with the rest of the world so these are the top four reasons that cyber criminals still find the middle east to be a lucrative target for them and and obviously this leads us back to the previous slide which is talking about the increasing frequency and impact of attacks that we're facing in the middle east I'd like to talk a little bit about the typical attitude that people ha people have towards cyber security incident response and that is what we have on this particular slide one of the responses incident response professionals uh, typically get is i've never been hacked 
So I don't think I'm going to be hacked. It's never happened so far. I don't see it happening this year. I know there are other organizations and you've got all these statistics and bar graphs and pie charts, but personally speaking, it's never happened to me. So I don't see it happening this year as well. I don't want to invest in your incident response tools. Now, this is a typical mindset, which, which is indicative of, you know, living under a false sense of security. One of the main reasons is um, the absence of sufficient trainings, su sufficient awareness mechanisms, and it is really uh, a really good opportunity for incident response professionals and cybersecurity professionals also to educate these um, these entities and try to get their levels of security maturity up to the mark. Another response that we get is, hey, we are PCI DSS compliant. We've already achieved compliance in ISO 27001 or SSA 16, various compliance standards. So we think we're reasonably secure. We don't think we are going to be attacked this year is one of the other reasons that we hear. People tend to confuse security with compliance, and I'm sure you'll agree with me here. Compliance is just a minimum benchmark of security controls. Different standards do it to different degrees. Now, PCI is uh, one of the standards that have that has a very, very high level of security maturity. However, it is not entire security. Now, just because I was PCI DSS certified last, uh, let's say, January, doesn't mean that I'm secure in July. Many organizations have been PCI DSS certified and have still been breached because the process of maintaining controls, and this is something that PCI really, really emphasizes, ongoing maintenance of controls is still not up to the mark in many organizations. However, the senior management only looks at the uh, the figures and they know that they have a PCI DSS certificate or ISO 27001 certificate. So they tend to assume that they are secure. However, this, this could be a really, really far factor from the reality. Another response is cybersecurity is still being perceived as a technology issue, especially in the Middle East, this response is being seen. Uh, it is not a management issue, it is not a governance issue, it is something that the IT team has to, take in, has to take care of. And as we saw in one of the earlier slides, it's definitely not a technology issue, it is not to be carried out in silos. Incident response has to be spread across your people, your processes, as well as your technology. Technology is just one of the means through which you achieve it, it is definitely not the end. Yet another reason uh, response that we get is, hey, I'm too small to be targeted. Uh, the attackers are probably after the Aramco's of the world, the Sony's of the world. I'm just a small uh, reseller based here in, the, in Dubai and nobody's really going to look at me. However, we have statistics that prove that this is definitely not true. Organizations, I'm sorry, cyber cr criminals are seeing that if they target a very small organization which has very low security maturity, the, the presence of cash is something that is given in this region. So they, they see that they are getting bigger returns and, and it's a lot easier to get it in the case of smaller organizations. So this excuse that, hey, nobody is going to look at me because I'm too small to be targeted, definitely does not hold good. What are the challenges that you will see when you're trying to, trying to enforce incident response maturity across organizations? The absence of senior management support, we have discussed this on the earlier slides, so this is definitely going to be there. If you're going to go, ahead, go out to your end customer and tell them, um, you need to invest in an incident response tool or, or you need to increase your incident response maturity, the senior management support and their levels of awareness are definitely going to be a challenge. And, and the next few slides, we're going to talk about how we can, we can address these challenges. Another problem in cybersecurity incident response is delayed detection. I already mentioned this. How quickly can an organization detect that it has been breached? There is a FireEye report that says that in the Middle East, it takes more than 400 days. That is more than a year. And whereas in, uh, on the global level, it is only 200 plus days. So the Middle East is typically taking more than a year to detect that it has been breached. Whereas the rest of the world is doing significantly better. It is detected in 200 days, which is a little over six months. So, so this is one of the biggest challenges how quickly can we detect that we've been breached? How do we know that we've not already been breached? These are kinds of questions that end customers need to look at and need to have solid answers for. The other challenge in incident response is poor coordination, and this is especially true if you're a huge organization. I have multiple teams, and, and very often these teams operate independently with, with not very good levels of coordination between themselves. This becomes a really, really big issue when you've been breached. Okay, consider this, you need to get something done in your company and it takes, um, it, it might be a very simple thing, but it might take a week to get it done because there is a requester, there is an approver, and then there is a post implementation reviewer. So because of this concept of separation of duties, multiple teams are involved. And what this means is, what is relatively a simple task, like let's say installing a software on your on your laptop, will take more than a week to get done. All right, or some, some cases even months, depending on how big your organization is. Now consider this, you have been breached 
and you need to find out what has happened. You need to really, really be very quick. The same scenario will definitely not help you. You need a rapid action team which is able to quickly coordinate between respect to owners and is able to identify quickly what went wrong and how quickly can we save the organization. Time is really off their sense when you've been breached. All right, so this is yet another critical challenge that will be faced when you're, when you're designing an incident response program. Yet another challenge is the absence of sufficient subject matter expertise. We'll be discussing a case on one of the next few slides and we'll see how because of the absence of you know, su subject matter knowledge in-house, external consultants were hired and many organizations tend to do this because they don't have the capability and that is totally fine as long as they have access to consultants uh, who have an established relationship with the organization they will be able to quickly recover their their processes in the face of an incident the reason it is uh, important that you have existing relationships is and again you will you will agree here with me when you hire an external consultant they take their own time to learn about the organization it takes about a week or sometimes even months depending on how big your organization is and of course it depends on the consultant himself or herself right so if you have existing relationships with external consultants they will be familiar to some level with the inner workings of your organization and this can really spell the difference between life and death when an organization has been breached yet another challenge is organizations as i said earlier have defined incident response pro programs incident response procedures however it is just a piece of paper that exists on the internet Okay, it is not something that people read. It is not something that is tested. And there are, there are, for instance, phone numbers on these incident response procedures, people who have to be called in the, in, in the event of an incident. But in the absence of testing, these phone numbers might also be obsolete. They might be outdated. Right? So it is really, really important that incident response programs are tested at least once a year. In critical organizations, at least once in six months is what we would recommend. However, this is, uh, um, this is not something that is being done by organizations. It's, again, a far factor from reality. With that background, which I hope I've been able to establish sufficiently, we will come over to the main and the core slide of this particular webinar. What are the success metrics in cybersecurity incident response? When I say metrics, please pay attention. That is a key word of this entire webinar. We want to arrive at tangible metrics which can be quantified. We're not going to be talking in, um, in, in the air. Or rather, we're going to have really solid numbers through which we can measure the efficiency or the success of my entire cybersecurity incident response program. And these metrics are what we hope to derive at the end of this particular webinar. Now, what you see up here on the slide is the set of steps that should be followed in a typical cybersecurity incident response workflow. All right, we have the first step starting with triage, and then we have investigation, containment, and lastly, we have recovery and prevention. Communication with stakeholders is something that should be initiated from the moment the final investigate the, the initial investigation has been initiated and this should be maintained on an ongoing basis till the incident investigation has been closed you'll agree with me again that these are the steps that would be present in almost any incident response workflow there, there may be a few minor changes here and there but the final objectives would still be these steps let us go through each of them i will quickly try to cover what each step basically is all about we'll start with triage triage is nothing but level one analysis now, people who are familiar with medical terms would, would have heard this term before. For example, when a patient is brought to a hospital, the first level of, in, of inspection that is done on this patient is what is called triage. Nurses and doctors work in, uh, work in unison to try, to try to assess what is the level of injury that this particular patient has undergone. And based on this level one analysis, the next course of action is, is uh, decided. So this is exactly what happens in triage in, an, in, a, in a cyber security incident as well. Level one incident anal analysts will try to gather as much data as possible. And of course, this is as soon as incident has been detected or has been reported. Try to gather as much data has been, uh, as, as is available and then create an incident, log it in a formal incident management tool. Some organizations have web-based tools, um, like it can even be something as simple as Remedy, wherein an incident case is created, uh, an incident ticket number is created. A priority is assigned for this incident. Now, the reason we should have the priority given in the, in the right manner is because the priority, priority determines how quickly the incident has to be closed. If it is a low priority incident, it can still take its time, but high priority incidents have to have defined SLAs. For example, it can be a, a day or even a week within which this incident investigation has to be closed. So the assignment of, of resources, time, effort, money, etc. would be uh, prioritized based on this level. 
lastly a case manager should be assigned uh, now this assumes the presence of an in-house incident investigation team uh, it can also be an external consultant but someone has to be assigned for this particular case this is these are the four main steps that happen in triage level two we will go on to is the investigation phase what happens in investigation is um, I hope you're staying with me. We are now on the green circle here, which is investigation. What happens in investigation is systematic and formal examination of this incident. The final outcome of this entire process should be the identification of the root cause of the incident. So multiple steps will uh, will be carried out in this step in the, in this particular phase, starting with the determination of the roadmap for the investigation. So for instance, if it is a malware infection on the machine, a, a cyber forensic investigator would be an, would be assigned for this case in the triage in level four of triage, which is what you see here. And he or she will, will chart out a roadmap for the investigation. And he will initiate the processes of quarantining the machine. He will initiate the process of collecting as much evidence as possible and then work towards identifying the root cause. Now, some people can argue that uh, that quarantine cannot be successful until the root cause has been identified. And, and I would definitely agree with that. So just to just in the interest of time is why the process of quarantining for example it's as simple as taking the machine off the network should be initiated as quickly as possible and that is done but even before the root causes is, is root cause is identified once the root cause is known the process of quarantining has to be all the more streamlined and all the more focused to ensure that it is complete next up we come to the phase of containment which is basically nothing but damage control try to minimize the impact of the incident try to make sure that um, the overall damage that is caused by the incident is as little as possible now of course this is only um, in, in many cases wishful thinking because in many incidents people are still left grappling with what what, with what, re what really is happening right how do we contain this incident especially in the case of cyber attacks it takes time uh, between root cause analysis and containment the the window of time that it takes is sometimes huge a step that i missed here is communication and as i said earlier it has to be initiated as soon as the case investigator has been assigned he or she has to identify who are the stakeholders that have to be updated of this incident now for example if this is a listed company then it is legally required um, to divulge the fact that it has been breached and in many cases it doesn't even have to be listed but due to legal or contractual obligations it will have to be uh, it will be enforced uh, upon the organization that it updates stakeholders of the fact that it has been breached Customers may have to be notified. Uh, other stakeholders, shareholders, etc., will have to be given an update on a time-to-time -time basis that their data has been breached. Right. So, the process of communication should be initiated in the investigation phase itself, and it has to be continued until the investigation is closed. Next, we'll come out to the recovery or prevention phase. The key objectives of this phase is to get business up and running as quickly as possible get business back to normal operations business as usual BAU should be the output of this particular process and yet another significant requirement here is identify steps or basically lessons learned to ensure that this particular incident does not recur now it sounds really simple to say this but truth be told organizations are still struggling with this it's the same incident happens over and over again in the same organization sometimes within the same teams and and this is something that organizations are not taking seriously in terms of identifying the root cause of the incident identifying how do they prevent this incident from recurring and then enforcing it this requires ongoing trainings one of the ways through which we can we can achieve this it requires the implementation of proper cyber security tools maybe the control ecosystem is not good has to be upscaled that is not being done so multiple reasons exist and and um, as I told you earlier, we have a case which is coming up on the next slide wherein we will discuss how this was actually taken up in a real incident. So I've explained on the slide uh, four circles, four phases rather in an incident response workflow and what happens in each of them. Now we're going to try and identify what are the success metrics. As I said, we want quantifiable numbers uh, based on which we can identify how successfully each of these steps is being carried out by an organization. So first off, coming over to the triage phase, what are the success metrics that I will have, I will want for my incident response workflow in the triage phase? The first and uh, uh, the first and most foundational phase of any incident is how quickly is it being detected? The time to detect or the time to report this particular incident is of utmost importance. And as I said earlier, this is something where the Middle East is really, really lagging behind. It takes more than a year, according to FireEye, for incidents to be reported in the in the Middle East. Whereas in the rest of the world, it takes about six months. Yet another success metrics is, metric is 
the use of a formal incident response or incident management tool. I told you there is a case where organizations use Remedy, which is a ticket management tool. Some organizations use Excel, some use Outlook. They just run it over emails. All said and done, there should be a way for organizations to document that the incident has happened. It should be possible for the organization to retrieve all the incidents that happened over a period of time. It can be one year, it can be five years, but this data should be available to organizations. What was the level of uh, priority that was assigned to the incident? What was the, um, uh, the the time for closure of this particular incident? All these metrics, all these factors have to be documented by organizations. And this is the reason it's really recommended that you have a formal incident management tool where all the artifacts, all the paradigms of an incident are formally captured. The reason is when you have this data available to you, you can define measures to understand where exactly the organization is failing in its cybersecurity incident response workflow, right? So how many cases in my organization are formally recorded on a case management system? That would be a success metric in this particular phase. Yet another success metric is, I'll, um, I'll highlight it with my pointer, cases which are not self-investigated. Now, I don't know if you are able to relate to this, but I will explain this. In some organizations, you will see that when an incident has been detected, it can be as simple as a password sharing case. The delivery manager or the end user's manager, he or she would do a, a personal investigation. That's what I like to call it, a self-investigation or a personal investigation, and then report it to the, to the incident management team or the cybersecurity team. This is something that is a very, very big no-no because First off, it destroys the scene of the crime. So when a forensic investigator comes over in, uh, to the scene of the crime, he does not have the advantage of being the first person on the scene. The evidence can be destroyed, although unintentionally, by the business manager. But this happens. Okay, The, the business manager, in the interest of his employee or, uh, or the endpoint that is being targeted, would perform a self-investigation. And this is something that happens in organizations. This is a huge no-no. And trainings and awareness have to be carried out within organizations to make sure that employees know what to do when they detect a breach. The first thing they should do is report it. They should know how to report it. What is the phone number to call? What is the email ID to, to which it has to be sent? That data has to be available to all employees within an organization, no matter which department they are in. However, this is not being carried out in organizations. And there are oftentimes cases where managers do a self-investigation. This metric, how many cases were self-investigated? How many cases were there where our investigator did not have the advantage of being the first person on the scene? that would be a success metric we want this number to be as little as low as possible next up the third point here is how many qualified investigators have we got on our team this uh, point which i'm highlighting with my with my mouse pointer how many qualified people do we have how many people are certified uh, there are multiple cyber security incident response certifications how many of our team actually have these certifications how many trainings have we given them over the course of the year how many external consultants have we got and how many of them have an existing relationship with us i told uh, i mentioned earlier about the importance of having an existing relationship because when an incident has incident is detected you will not have time for an external consultant to come in and then learn about the organization no you should have a consultant who's already familiar with the organization and who knows what tools are available, what controls are in place, so he or she knows exactly where he needs to search for the root cause of the incident. Now we are coming over to the next phase, which is an investigation. What are the success metrics in the investigation phase? The first point is number of documented asset owners slash custodians. And this point, the first point is, is more or less related to the next to the third point here, which is updated call tree. Right? The reason I mentioned this here is the presence of this data will actually help the investigator to know in which direction he or she should should uh, shoot out his first mails. So for instance, a machine has been infected. I want to quarantine it. I want to take it out for my analysis. But how do I do this? How do I know who's the responsible asset owner of this machine? Who's the responsible custodian of this machine? That is the reason um, uh, you know compliance standards like ISO 27001 or PCI, etc. talk about having a documented list of asset owners and custodians. This plus this data plus the updated call tree will actually help your investigator to quicken the process. You don't want your investigators losing time trying to find out who's responsible for what, because as I said earlier, time is of the utmost uh, essence in the when you're when you're facing a breach. Yet another metric is response SLA in your MSA. Now this applies, for example, when the asset belongs to a third-party service provider. Right. So, for example, my server has been hacked, but it is not on my premises. It is with my third party data hosting, uh, sorry, data center services provider. When I know that there has been a breach, I want him to get this this particular third party service provider to get back to me with a close with a closure to this investigation within n number of days. 
that number of days should be clearly defined in the S in the MSA that I've signed, the contract that I've signed with this third party service provider. How many such contracts have this SLA defined? Many don't, a few do. All right, so having this number will help you to define your success metric in this phase. And of course, the, the importance of trainings for your investigation personnel to make sure that they are suitably qualified. That is yet another uh, success metric. How many trainings did we have this year for our team is a question organizations have to ask themselves. Next up, we are coming to the phase of containment. What are my success metrics in the containment phase? Now, the key objective of containment is minimize the impact of the incident and make sure that it has it, its spread has been contained. The impact is not more than what it should be. How do we verify this? How do we make sure that the incident has been contained? That is the question number one that an investigator has to ask himself or herself when he when the containment phase has been completed. All right, verified and documented evidence that the containment has been completed. How many cases are there that have this? How many cases have um, have a scenario where the containment was not only verified by the investigator but also approved by his or her manager? That is a question that has to be asked. Lastly, we are coming over to recovery slash prevention. How quickly were we able to restore operations is a question to be asked over here. Number of cases where the priority level, which I mentioned earlier, it can be P1, P2, P3, etc., is commensurate with the actual time that it took you to close an investigation. So, for example, if it is of high priority, level one incident, it has to be closed within three days. How many cases did we comply with this with this timeline? How many cases were we not able to meet it? That is a metric to be taken in this in this particular phase. Number of repeat incidents is also another important metric because in this phase you define what are the lessons learned and how do we make sure that this incident does not recur. All right, what are the measures to be taken to prevent to ensure this incident does not recur? When the same incident recurs again, let's say three times, you have a metric there, which is three times the incident has recurred, which means my steps taken to prevent recurrence have failed. Okay, so these are some of the metrics which which we can quantify in each of the phases of an incident response process. And I, I would strongly advocate that every organization look to its own incident response policy and try to identify where the metrics are. Now, what I've given here is a generic uh, set of metrics, but this can definitely be adapted to any organization of any kind in my experience. So please look at these metrics and try to adapt them to your own, to your own or your end users incident response policies. As I mentioned earlier, we have a small case. I will not be spending more than five minutes on this. We will look at the case of the Saudi Aramco attack and, and see how they fared in, in, in the face of the same incident response workflow. Everybody knows about the attack. Just to share a little bit of background, in, um, in 2012, August 15th of 2012, Aramco employees noted that uh, their machines were behaving a little um, you know, unusually. Machines were being formatted and and that uh, the, the desktops were being wiped clean and being replaced by the picture of a burning flag. Now this is one of the biggest hacks in the history of the world and and Aramco is literally brought down to its knees. More than 35,000 of their endpoints were hacked and and the company had to use um, typewriters and fax machines instead of emails and um, uh, you know computers to carry their business operations. Now the attack was not entirely successful in in the sense the core objective of whoever carried the attack was to um, um, was to impair the supply of oil. Now that was not that was not successful, but the organization was literally impaired in terms of its other operations. So let us see how this particular case, a very very famous case, which I'm sure 90% of us here in the audience would already be aware of, uh, how did this fare in the face of our success metrics? First off, in the triage phase, how quickly was the incident detected? We still don't have solid numbers. It is somewhere between one and two months. All right. Now that is not a really good timeline when you've been breached when a company like Aramco has been breached you want to know it within days not 60 days maybe one to two days so that really doesn't look good secondly in terms of expertise they already have an existing uh, cyber security team but they still acted quickly and they hired external consultants consultants were flown in from the Netherlands as well as from the US Symantec was engaged to to analyze the malware that was installed which is basically a uh, code named Shamoon uh, so they were really quick to act on that particular direction so that is a really good sign that external uh, investigators were uh, hired. That being said, um, there is an interview of the consultant who was brought in from the Netherlands, and she said that she did take some time to blend into the organization. There was an initial culture shock that she faced um, since she was fairly new to the organization and its culture. So that was uh, something which was more on the negative side, but but this is something that is present in the real world, and, and um, at the end of the day, it was taken care of by Aramco. 
Next up, we're coming to the investigation phase. Again, the root cause of this incident is still not clear. There are versions where you say, where it is said that it was a phishing mail that was clicked by uh, one of the internal employees. People don't really still know when this mail was sent. Another version says that it may have been a USB stick which was carried in by one of the employees and plugged into the machines. That is how the malware got into the network. So the root cause of the incident, there is uh, still debate on terms of what it was. In terms of damage control and containment of the incident, systems were physically, physically disconnected by Aramco and um, the impact of the incident was minimized to a really good extent. So people in the absence of other measures actually walked up to the machines and the data centers and they plugged out the, the, the network cables because they realized that was the best way to get it off. So they were really quick in that, in that sense. However, in, the, in terms of recovery and steps to prevent this incident from happening, that is where a great deal of effort happened in, in terms of resuming operations. Uh, people who are familiar with the case will know that there were lines of trucks lined up all over outside uh, Aramco's plants waiting for oil, but Aramco was not able to supply them with oil because of this issue, because of the hack. But still, there were solid efforts taken. 50,000 replacement hard drives were purchased by Aramco, and that is huge. It really affected the market of uh, the hard of hard disks uh, supply because they didn't want to go ahead and wipe their existing um, infected machines and uh, replace and and reinstall the OS. Rather, they decided to replace them. They went ahead and bought 50,000 replacement hard drives. As I said earlier, fax replaced email because they were they were they were not online. Then the phones were all switched off, switched off, computers were off. So they they relied on fax to talk to each other. Typewriters were used to, ty to type out invoices and, and other things. At the end of the day, it still took them five months to get back to business as usual, which is a significant amount of time. And in terms of repeat incidents, making sure the incident does not recur, Shamoon still resurfaced in 2016. So other organizations have not taken a lesson from this incident which happened to Aramco. All right, so that is something which is to be questioned. Uh, Shamoon was able to still come back in 2016. In terms of prevention of this incident within Aramco, they went ahead and hired new cybersecurity employees. The team was expanded. The capabilities were extended. A new SOC was set up inside Saudi itself, and that is really, really commendable. At the end of the day, when you try to summarize the entire case for the Saudi Aramco attack, detection was not really up to the mark because it did, it did take them some time. The root cause of the incident is also really not up because we are still debating in terms of what it was. Containment efforts were good. Recovery cost, if you if you compute it based on, let's say, $100 per hard drive, they purchased 50,000 hard drives. It really adds up to a minimum of $5 million US dollars, and that is, that is not a small amount. The time it took them to get back to business was five months. So as we can assume, a minimum of $5 million was lost, and this is just a minimum. I'll, re I'll emphasize that again. And five months of productive time was also lost. The net loss to Aramco from this incident is, is something that we really cannot compute at this point. With that case in mind, let us come out to, to let us spend not more than five minutes on what are the vendor solutions that are available to us in the market today in terms of cybersecurity incident response. FireEye, I'm sure you're aware, you're aware of, has their Mandiant tool, Mandiant solution, and incident response services here promise a dedicated set of incident responders for your case. They will be up on your field if you've been breached or your end customer has been breached. They'll work with you quickly. To, rapid, to rapidly investigate your issue, your issue and your incident and come out with a proper and comprehensive remediation. On the same line, we have Cisco also offering incident response services and they help you to prepare proactively, not only after an incident has happened, but also in, uh, before it has happened. They help you to prepare for incidents. Many of the success metrics that I mentioned in this particular webinar would be considered by Cisco in their uh, incident response service. Lastly, I'm also talking about McAfee here on this particular slide. They help you in not only incident response, but also in forensics. Their USP, rather, uh, unique selling point is to quickly respond and minimize the overall impact. All these dimensions that you see up here on the slide are points that we discussed, and they are key success metrics, extremely important for your successful incident response program. I would request you to please carry this message over to your end customers as well. Now, this list is only an indicative list of our vendor solutions. Bear in mind that all our vendors offer very, very com competent solutions in incident response. That being said, Ingram Micro has its own in-house team of consultants. What you see up here on the slide is a set of cybersecurity consultancy services that we offer. But what I'm highlighting here is our incident management solutions. We have qualified consultants who are able to come up onto your field and work with you or your end customers. We can help you in all the phases of incident response, starting with triage, root cause analysis, steps to identify, um, steps to minimize and contain the incident, communication to your stakeholders. We help you in conducting interviews of internal employees or um, uh, 
internal employees who may be involved in the incident. The entire end-to-end -end process going all the way down to writing your report is something that Ingram Micro Consultants can help you with. I also mentioned a lot about the training aspect of incident response and yes, I'm very, very happy to report that incident Ingram Micro has a very focused training on incident response. What you see here is the entire suite of trainings that we offer, but I'm going to highlight the incident response training, which is CyberSec first responder training. A five day training that we offer is from the CompTIA suite and uh, it helps you also to work towards your CFR training, CFR certification. If you are interested or your end customers are interested in qualifying themselves in incident response, this is the best way to st get started. Cybersecurity, CyberSec first responder training, it is very well acclaimed from CompTIA. And Ingram Micro is happy to offer this five day training to you. We can give it on premise or even at uh, an Ingram Micro training facility or we can even come out to your premises and give you this particular training. Okay, with that update, I'm very happy to pass the mic on to my um, colleague Vikram, who is going to give you an update on our initiatives and activities. Over to you, Vikram. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Vikram here from uh, the cybersecurity team. I handle the business support activities. Today, I'm just going gi to be giving you a brief on our initiatives and activities update. Um, firstly, I am pleased to inform you that our website is now live and can be reached at security.ingrammicro.com. So here you're going to be able to find the, all the information regarding our services, trainings, and vendor solutions. You will also be able to book sessions with our consultants or share your information and service of interest so that we may get in touch with you to have a more detailed discussion. Um, I will be doing a live demo of our web after our, uh, I go through these points. Um, secondly, we're, uh, Ingram Micro is hosting the 2017 Cyber Lockdown, which is a global virtual training event hosted on our virtual training platform called Fit Live World. You will be sent an invitation for this uh, event and attend this one day event to learn how to think like a hacker and hear from cybersecurity experts on the best practices in detecting and defending against these dangerous attacks. Also note that uh, the speakers that will be hosting these keynotes will be high profile in the, in the domain of cybersecurity. Um, our website has also been uploaded with the agenda for all our coming security events and webinars along with the registration forms. So I'm going to be showing you how to uh, register for them and so please go and check our website and register for the upcoming events and webinars. We are also hosting the Cloud and Security Summit on November 19th, 20th, and 21st at the Beach Rotana Hotel in Abu Dhabi. At the summit, you will be able to attend multiple keynote sessions by our cloud and security vendors. You will be able to participate in up to 30 breakout sessions by consultants from both domains. We are yet to open for registrations, but you will definitely be informed once we do. Again, please do get in touch with us for an enablement session at your premises or through WebEx uh, on the value that Ingram Micro is trying to bring with our cybersecurity offerings. Um, now, I'm just going to go through our uh, website, do a quick live demo, so please bear with me. Now, as you can see here, um, this is the uh, home page and you can access this uh, by going to security.ingramicro.com and uh, here you will be able to view our security webinars, the ones we've done in the past. We also have something called the Security Resource Center, which I'll show you, where you can download white papers as well as go through any material that we have and you can also schedule trainings. Now, if you go down, you can look at all the vendors that we distribute in this region, and you can do it by uh, different domains. So, for example, if you need something in the data domain, you can look at the vendors that are present in that area. Um, same goes for application and so on, SIEM and all those things. And these are our awards. Uh, you can have a look at them as well. Um, we also are, so we've split our services into consultancy and assessment services. So if you click on assessment, for example, it's going to give you all our offerings. You can also book the services and know more about the service. So if, for example, you click on know about, about the service, you're going to understand what the scope of the service is, uh, what the deliverables are, and the service delivery time. You can also book the assessment service by clicking the button, and you can um, fill out uh, which service that you require. Give us your details, and we'll get back in touch with you. 
we also have the training uh, material here uh, you can uh, look at all the trainings that we have on offer again same concept you can know more about the course as well as you can book a training so if you for example you want to book the training you just click the button and uh, select which course that you want and uh, say for example you want the cyber safe half day edition so it's going to tell you where it is available and on which date. So for example, this course is available only in Dubai. We also have many courses throughout the Meta region and they will be updated as we go. Finally, um, just a quick update here. You have the events and webinars like I mentioned in the updates. Here you can look at all the uh, upcoming webinars and events that we have. You can also register for them. Um, there's going to be a button right next to it. And also we have the resource center where you can download and view documents uh, on various cybersecurity topics, as you can see here. So that is it from my side. Um, I think we are good for questions now. So please pop in your questions in the questions uh, tab and we will answer them. Let's uh, spend about five minutes on that. And any questions can be taken offline as well. Thank you so much for listening. We hope that you had a very informative session with Praveen. Thank you very much, Praveen, for the session. Um, again, guys, you can send your questions in. Uh, waiting for them. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a question from Hassan Kadumi on uh, technical and pre-sales employees. When will they be updated on it? Uh, Hassan, can you please uh, get in, be a little bit more specific, please? What is the update you're seeking on? Hassan, you there? Okay, so uh, the question from Hassan is, we have pre-sales for McAfee. Uh, do they need these technology certifications? Um, Hassan, the, these certifications are definitely a, a very, very good to have, uh, but I, I don't believe that they are mandated, but they are definitely something that is going to qualify you towards uh, being able to to position a McAfee product in a better way. McAfee has very focused solutions on incident response and having a uh, certification, um, like for instance, CFR is definitely going to help you in positioning it correctly to your end customers. Any other questions? Uh, Hassan, I hope that helped. Okay, so uh, we have no further questions is what I believe, but do feel free to uh, contact us if you have any follow-up questions that come up sometime later in the day as you as you go over what we discussed. Thank you very much for your time. I'd really like to uh, thank everybody for their time. Um, thank you, Vikram, and thank you, Mark. Oh, I'm sorry, there's another follow-up question from Hassan. Do we have officially training for partners uh, and uh, for example on PCI DSS. Yes, Hassan, I'm very happy to report that we do have trainings for partners. Um, the entire suite of trainings was, was one of the slides we showed uh, during the webinar. Feel free to get in touch with us. Um, you can contact us through the website security.ingrammicro.com or you can also email us and we are more than happy to schedule a one-on-one. -on -one. We, can, we can do these trainings for you or for the end, or for the end partners. So that is something which is a definite yes. In terms of prices, yes, I'm more than happy to share them with you. Please get get in touch with uh, with us, uh, Hassan. We can we can work out the prices. The prices are available, and we're happy to share them out for you.
All right then, since uh, there are no further questions and we've reached the end of our time, uh, thank you so much for listening and uh, hope we hope to see you again for our next webinar. Thank you so much. Have a nice day ahead.